Hello, everyone, and welcome to NSBA's Night School, Introduction to Steel Bridge Design. Today is June 6, 2016, and this is Session 1, Introduction to Bridge Engineering, presented by Anna Teague, Joanne Shaner, and Dominic Coletti. My name is Christina Harbour, and I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group. I'll be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Anna Teague is the Bridge Group Manager for the Raleigh, North Carolina office of HDR. She received both her bachelor's and master's degrees from North Carolina State University. Anna has 12 years of structural engineering experience. Welcome, Anna. I'll let you take over from here. Thank you so much, Christina. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for taking time out of your schedule to join us tonight. As the previous slides mentioned, NSBA Night School is an eight-part course designed to introduce the audience to basic concepts of steel bridge design. Tonight is session one, and we'll cover an introduction to bridge engineering. Session two will go over an introduction in history of AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications. And session three will describe steel material properties. Session four will go over loads and analysis. Session five will describe steel bridge fabrication. Session six will talk about plate girder design and stability. Session seven will cover the effects of curvature and skew. And finally, session eight will discuss fatigue and fracture design. This is session one of the course, and tonight we'll be covering the basics of bridge engineering. We won't be going into great detail on any of these topics, but rather our goal is to give you an overview of the fundamentals of bridge engineering. The first thing we're, we're going to cover tonight is terminology or bridge nomenclature. The terminology that we will cover is generally accepted as industry standard. However, the nomenclature can vary widely from state to state or agency to agency, so just keep that in mind. There are three main elements of a bridge, the superstructure, the substructure, and the foundation. We will first take a look at the components of the superstructure. But before we begin, let's see how familiar we all are with some basic superstructure terminology by answering a quiz question. OK, everyone. The question is, which of the terms below is not part of the superstructure? A, piles. B, diaphragm. C, wearing surface. D, deck. Or E, sidewalk. And you can go ahead and select your answer by clicking on the circular button next to the response you'd like. And you can hit the Submit button. We'll give everyone a few minutes to think about that and to submit your answer. All right, it looks like most people have responded. And most people have chosen A. Well, you guys did great. I'm, I'm very impressed. So you, you are almost all right that piles is the correct answer. It's not part of the superstructure. We're going to see that term piles later as part of the foundation discussion. So what exactly is a superstructure? Well, the quick and easy definition is everything above the substructure. And we'll get to substructure later. The main function of a superstructure is to provide a riding surface for traffic loads and to carry these loads across some distance or span to the supports, which are the substructure elements. The elements of a superstructure can include barrier, median, sidewalk, deck, wearing surface, deck forms, girders, cross frames, diaphragms, lateral bracing, and bearings. 
As we mentioned earlier, there are exceptions to every rule. And in the world of bridge inspections, the deck is treated as its own entity, separate from the rest of the superstructure. We will identify each of these elements here, but Joanne will cover these in more detail later on in the presentation. In this picture, you can see several elements of the superstructure, including the median barrier, wearing surface, sidewalk, and barrier. These are elements that we are all very familiar with because we get to see them every day. Barriers protect vehicles and pedestrians from falls or collisions. Sidewalks provide pedestrian ac access across the structure. And wearing surfaces provide a smooth ride for motorists. And in this photograph, you can see the median running here, which will separate traffic. The wearing surface is here. We're all familiar with sidewalks. And the exterior barrier is here protecting the pedestrians. Other elements of the superstructure may be less familiar to us, unless, of course, you like to look at the underside of bridges. In this picture, you can see deck forms, which support the wet concrete of the deck until it is cured. The deck forms here function in a similar manner to the forms used in building construction. Girders are typically the main load carrying members, which span from support to support. The girders sit on bearings, which accept the load at a point and oftentimes accommodate movement from the girder and the deck above. Cross frames provide lateral support to the girder members in their weak axis of bending. And here in this photograph, you can see the deck forms, in this case are metal pans. The girders are these elements that we see running along here. And where the girder rests on the substructure unit is where our bearing is located. Cross frames help stabilize the girders in the lateral direction. Next, we'll discuss the components of the substructure. So if a superstructure is everything above the substructure, the substructure is everything below the superstructure and typically above the ground. Some common substructure elements are listed here. They include abutments, which are also called indents, and vents, which are also called piers. An abutment or indent is typically located at the end of a bridge, and a pier or vent is an intermediate support. In this photograph, our abutments are here and here, and our intermediate supports, or our piers, are here and here. Pier caps, also called bent caps, provide a surface on which bearings rest and subsequently transmit load from the superstructure down into the substructure. The column picture here provides a route for the load to travel to the foundation. Last but not least, we will go over the elements of the foundation. By now, you should be able to deduce that foundations are the bridge elements that are typically below the ground surface. This can include footing, drilled shafts, and piles. Since you can't see them, foundations are probably the elements of a bridge that are least familiar to us. But all that load from the bridge has to go somewhere, and the foundations provide a method to distribute that load to the ground below the bridge. You can see some of the typical bridge foundations pictured here. In this illustration, the drilled shaft is below a column. And in this illustration, we have piles that are located below a pile cap. In this picture, you can see a spread footing, which is also located beneath a column.
there are numerous other elements to a bridge, and some of these are listed here. Joints allow for movement that occur in a structure. Approach slabs provide a transition from the roadway to the bridge. Slope protection, which can be riprap or concrete, armors the slopes that surround the indents. And wing walls are a part of the abutment or indent that retain fill in the slope transition area. There are many different types of bridges, and we will discuss some of the most common and some of the most distinctive types tonight. You may drive over one of these and never even realize it, but a deck arch is easy to spot if you can see the bridge in profile view. The arch itself is located entirely below the deck. This type of bridge can accommodate long spans and is a good choice for deep valleys with steep walls. As with any bridge type, coordination with other disciplines such as hydraulics, roadway, and geotechnical is critical for design. In the case of steep canyon walls, the geotechnical aspect of foundation design for this deck arch was a key component to its type selection. The New River Gorge Bridge is an iconic example of a deck arch bridge. And in this photograph, our deck is running along here. And as you can see, the entire arch is located below the deck surface. The main difference between a deck arch and a through arch bridge is in where the deck resides. In a through arch, the deck resides at the bottom of the arch. Because of this, a through arch provides significantly more under clearance than a deck arch, making it more suitable for water crossings. Oftentimes, in a deck arch, the deck will be used as a tie between the ends of the arch. Since the arch is on top of the deck, it's visible to the traveling public. So this type of bridge is frequently viewed as a signature structure for its aesthetic quality. And here in this photograph, you can see our deck running here. And then the entire arch structure is located above the deck. A partial through arch marries the concept of a deck arch and a through arch. The deck in a partial through arch is located somewhere in the arch itself. It can either be a true arch or a tied arch. In a true arch bridge, the outward directed horizontal forces of the arch are transmitted directly to and therefore resisted by the foundation. A tied arch bridge is an arch bridge in which these forces of the arch or top cord are resisted by the bottom cord in tension rather than by ground or bridge foundations. The deck can act as a tie in a tied arch bridge. So now that we've learned a little bit about arch bridges, let's see if that knowledge can translate to truss bridges. And our next question. A bridge which has top and bottom cords below the deck is called a, a through truss, B, a partial through truss, C, a deck truss, D, a supported stringer system, or E, a cantilever truss. And just to remind everyone, you can select uh, what you think is the correct answer and just hit submit right on your screen. Give everyone a few more seconds to submit their answers. All right, Anna, it looks like we have most people selecting C, a deck trust, but we do have a few people selecting A and B. Well, you guys are still on point tonight. The correct answer is deck trust, so good job.
A deck trust is similar in concept to a deck arch. The trust portion of a deck truss, both the top and the bottom cords, is located below the bridge deck. Because of this, the main truss spacing can be tighter than in a through truss. The advantage of this type of truss bridge is that it reduces the cost of lateral bracing systems because the truss spacing is closer together than in a through truss. This also makes this system easier to widen in the future. And in this photograph here, you guys can see our deck is at the top and all of our truss members are located below the deck. So what is a through truss? Well, you probably guessed it. The deck runs between the truss itself. This type of truss provides more underclearance than a deck truss, making it desirable when vertical clearance is limited. Similar, similar to a through arch, the load carrying members are visible to the traveling public, making this a recognizable and aesthetically interesting structure. And in this photograph, we have our deck here and then all of the trust members are located either at the level of or above the deck. A partial through truss meets in the middle between the deck truss and the through truss. And this is really easy to see in this photograph where we have our deck here, but we also have trust members above and also below the deck. Cable stayed bridges typically span very long distances and are used when underclearance is necessary. This is one reason why you may see these on navigable water crossings. The cables in these bridges support the deck and carry the load of the deck back to the towers which transmit the load down to the foundation. And this is a great picture where you can see the deck here and all of the cables are attached to the deck and run all the way up to the support pier, and that load from the cables is transmitted down through the support pier, down to the foundation. One of the most recognizable bridges in the world is a suspension bridge, and I bet you all can name it, the Golden Gate Bridge. A suspension bridge uses vertical cables that are attached to main cables, which are draped over the support piers. This type of bridge is also appropriate for very long spans. And in this picture, our deck is here supported by vertical cables attached to our main cables, all connecting back to our support pier, which transmits the load down to our foundations. A through girder bridge is a type of structure where the main girders are located outside the deck. The most common use of this type of structure is for railroad bridges as they are well suited for heavy loads. In this photograph, our girders are located here and here, which are outside the deck or in this case, the track surface. One of the most common types of bridges is a deck girder bridge. This structure type is common for highway bridges, and you probably drive over or under this type of structure every single day. Two types of deck girder bridges we will discuss today are girder or beam bridges and floor beam or substringer bridges. A girder or beam bridge is the workhorse of the highway structure world. The girders act as the main load carrying members, transmitting the load from the deck to the substructure units. These types of bridges have no major constraints when it comes to underclearance or overclearance. There are no arches or trusses to clear. They can be long or short, straight, curved, or skewed, which makes this a very versatile bridge type. And what we are looking at here are curved girders where the deck itself has not been placed. When the deck is placed, it will provide more lateral support to this whole bridge. Floor beam or substringer bridges 
is a subset of deck girder bridges. They utilize smaller members that support the deck or floor of the bridge, and these smaller members, stringers and floor beams, carry the loads to the main load carrying girders. This type of configuration creates a very stiff system and is capable of carrying heavy loads, making this a common choice for railroad bridges. That wraps up our introduction of bridge nomenclature and types of bridges. Next, Joanne will go into more detail on the components of a bridge and bridge plan sets. Thank you, Anna. Our next speaker is Joanne Shaner. She is the Ohio Bridge Section Manager for HDR in Cleveland, Ohio. She received both her bachelor's and master's degrees from Ohio University. Joanne has over 19 years of bridge design experience. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, Christina. As Anna mentioned, in this next section, we are going to cover more specifics about the superstructure and substructure elements. We will also cover typical plan sheets required in a set of construction drawings for the superstructure portion of a project. So we're going to start by starting at the top of the structure and working our way down. So the first element um, we want to cover are the barriers. And there are various types of barriers uh, which vary based on the preference of the owner as well as requirements governing the type and use of the structure. So for instance, vehicular barriers are required to be crash tested and the requirements are based on various elements such as design speed and volume of traffic. Pedestrian railing has height requirements depending on whether it's just used by pedestrians or, or if it also includes bicyclists. And then there are also um, aesthetic options. Like for instance, this is a very aesthetic uh, a barrier that's used out there on one of the structures. So you'll see that all over the place as well. And that's based on uh, you know, the owner's preference. So next uh, we have the decks. And the decks provide lateral stiffness to the superstructure. It also provides a riding surface for the traffic. Decks can be composed of different materials. Common types are precast or cast in place reinforced concrete or steel grid decks. Then we have the future wearing surface, which um, goes on top of a deck and it provides a smooth riding surface for older or damaged structures. We use this uh, load when we first originally designed a structure. We have to include for the future wearing surface as well, even during that initial design. Then we have deck forms. And deck forms, oops, sorry. I don't know what's going on. Let's go back here. Okay, sorry about that. Deck forms can provide or provide for the formwork for when uh, the concrete is poured for the deck. And they can be either stay in place or cast in place. Or I'm sorry. I'm Christina, I'm not sure why the screen keeps changing. Um, are you using the arrow? Yes. Okay. Try it again. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. We'll try again. Deck forms. They're used to form the deck and to support the wet concrete until it hardens. They can either be stay in place or removable. And sometimes states don't allow for deck forms to be stay in place, so it really depends on uh, who you, the owner of the structure is. If stay in place forms are permitted, the design needs to include the additional weight of the uh, forms themselves as well as material filling the form. So whether there's extra concrete or sometimes there's styrofoam placed in the, in the form, in the trays. So this load needs to be included when you do your design and then that's shown on the plan sheets. Next we have the girders themselves. So the first type is a rolled beam. Uh, rolled beams are efficient for shorter spans because they are at limited sizes and shapes. These are pre-established sizes and therefore they are very limited. And I again just want to emphasize that they are used for the shorter spans because of the limited number of sizes of, of, that there are. The next type of girder is a plate girder. So the plate girders can vary in sizes and shapes and therefore they can span greater distances than the rolled beams. I want to point out some elements of the plate girders here. So these are the flanges 
and the webs. And here's a bottom flange down here. And the, those three elements can vary in size depending on the design that you require for your, for your girders. So because of the various sizes and the fact that these are built up members, they can span a greater distance. One other element I want to point out here are the stiffeners that you can see here in this picture. Box girders are another type of built up section that can be used for longer distances, and they efficiently resist torsional effects. So a lot of times you will see these on curved structures. You can also see plate girders on curved structures as well, but sometimes you'll see these. Cross frames are used to provide torsional stiffness, both during construction and in the final condition. And these cross frames are also uh, individually designed, and they can be of different built up members and shapes and sizes depending on the conditions that you have. So these are angles that are attached to um, the girders using these various different plates. So you can see it better here in this uh, photograph. In some instances, you'll want to use diaphragms instead of cross frames. So for instance, when the angle of the cross frames become too flat because the beams are shallow, it's better to switch to using a steel diaphragm, which is pictured here on the screen. Another time to use diaphragms is if the loads are too high and the cross frame members won't work. But this is not a typical situation. And here you will see lateral bracing in this photo here. And the lateral bracing is used to provide lateral stiffness and to limit the lateral deflections. All right, beneath the beams are the bearings. And the main function of the bearing is to transfer the load from the superstructure to the substructure. The bearing has to be able to accommodate the longitudinal movement and the rotation of the structure. There are three general types of bearings, elastomeric, high load multi-rotational, and mechanical. The bearing type and size is a function of the design requirements and the magnitudes of the loads and the movements. So now we're going to go through and talk about each of these different types of bearings that are pictured here. The first is a rocker bearing. A rocker bearing accommodates moderate loads and minimal movement and moderate rotations. This is an older type of bearing which is rarely used today, but you will find these on rehabilitation projects. A more common type of bearing is the elastomeric bearing. So typically, uh, elastomeric bearing is, uh, has elastomer layers as well as steel reinforced la or steel layers to reinforce the elastomer. So in this picture, you can see um, this, uh, these lines here are the steel plates that are inside of the elastomeric bearing. This is a photo of an elastomeric bearing. They rely both on the friction and the resistance of the bonded steel shims to resist elastomer bulging. Thin, uniformly spaced elastomer layers allow for higher design compressive stresses and higher translation and rotation capacity than plain elastomeric pads. These next two types of bearings can be used interchangeably as they both provide for higher loads and larger movements. The first is a pot bearing. As you can see here in the diagram, a pot bearing includes an elastomeric pad as well, but in this case the pad is confined in a steel cylinder, which is here. I'll show you a photo of this in a few moments where you can see the cylinder. The second type that is similar to the pot bearing is the disc bearing, which is also for high loads, large movements, and moderate rotations. Instead of an elastomeric pad, an elastomeric disc molded from a urethane compound is used to handle the rotation. Pot and disc bearings are often used on curved structures or heavily skewed bridges because of the higher load and rotational capacity. And here is a photo of a disc bearing and a pot bearing. So when I mentioned the pot bearing and talked about the steel cylinder that encases the elastomer, that's this element right here. And this red element here is the disc that I mentioned, the elastomer disc that is used for the disc bearings. 
Also important to note about disk bearings is they can be guided or non-guided as well as fixed. Shown here is a guided bearing and a non-guided bearing. And the guides provide for or the the guides actually guide the movement in the longitudinal direction. So the last type of bearing I want to cover is a mechanical bearing. And this one is a roller bearing. It accommodates the heavy loads and the large movements. These are typically used in old trusses and arches and large steel structures. They are not commonly used today, but can be encountered in rehabilitation work. Okay, here's another question to review what we've learned. Which type of steel superstructure is appropriate for short spans? A, plate girders, B, rolled beams, C, box girders, or D, cross frame angles? And again, you can select your the response by clicking on the screen, select your choice, and hit Submit. And it looks like pretty much everyone has responded. It looks like most people have chosen B, rolled beams. Well, that's good because I tried to really emphasize that when I was talking about that slide. So roll beams indeed because of um, the, their, the limited sizes that they come in can only span sh the certain distances that those limited sizes can span over, which is, is pretty small compared to the plate girders or some of the other girders that, um, out there. So next we're going to briefly talk about the substructures. As Anna mentioned that the abutments are where the roadway ends and the bridge begins. So here, here you see the two abutments for this structure. And abutments, um, a couple of different types. There's an independent back wall type and an integral type of abutment. In this case you can see here's the beam seat where the bearing is sitting on top of the abutment, and here's the back wall for the abutment. And you can see the bearing and the end of the beam. So that's what we would typically call an independent back wall. Over here you can see an integral abutment. And in this case, the beam is embedded into the, the concrete, which makes up the back of the abutment. So you can't see the bearing or the end of the beam. So in the case of this type of abutment, the beam moves with the bearing, but the abutment doesn't move. It now it does flex a, you know, with the movements of the bridge, but, not, but it's not designed to move with the abutments, or I'm sorry, with the beams, where in the case of the integral abutment, the beams and the abutments are designed to, to move together. And I also mentioned the piers, and there's a few different types of piers that I'm going to briefly show you here. In this case, we have the cap and column pier. So you see the pier cap here with a variety, a multitude of columns underneath supporting the structure. And I want to point out in this one, because in a few minutes we're going to talk about an integral pier cap, but in this case the beam is sitting on top of a bearing which is sitting on top of this um, pier cap. Another type of pier is a single column pier, which you can see here where it's the larger uh, column, but there's only one of them supporting the cap. And a lot of times these are used in situations just like these where you have a, a high level bridge and it's over you know, a, an area where you want it to be aesthetically pleasing. So a minute ago I mentioned an integral pier cap. So the difference with an integral pier cap is you can see the beams are going through the pier cap as opposed to um, a couple slides ago where I showed you that the beam sat on top of the bearing on top of the pier cap. And in this case, you might want to use something like this if you have a vertical clearance issue. So for instance, if your traffic is, is um, running pretty close to the, uh, the pier cap here due to the skew of the bridge, then you might have an issue where you don't have enough room to have your pier cap actually below your beam. So you have to run your beams through your pier cap to give you more clearance. So that's just a quick look at a few substructure elements. Next I'd like to talk about a few of the plan sheets that you typically see in a, in a plan set. And these plan sheets we're going to talk about are just superstructure or the superstructure portion of the plan set. 
um, if you had a full set of plans, it would obviously include the foundation and the, and the substructure as well, but we're not going to touch on those tonight. So the first plan sheet is a plan and elevation. This is a plan view of a bridge lined up with the elevation view along a controlling line. So the controlling line could be like the center line of construction. It could be the baseline of a ramp. Um, those are a couple of examples. But the, this will show critical features and the geometry control for the bridge. So the plan view is this portion down here. And here's the um, elevation view. And again, when we're talking about them being lined up, you'll see that you know, the piers are lined up with, with the, the plan view and the elevation view. The next plan sheet is a typical section. This shows superstructure features and dimensions, including roadway width, girder types, and spacing. And if we zoom in a little bit here, we can also see some different elements in the typical section. So here's your girders. This is the girder spacing. It's cut off in this image, but the girder spacing is included on the typical section. Here are your cross frames. You can see the deck reinforcing. You can see the barrier and over here on this side as well. So it gives you an idea of what you can see in the typical section. The next plan sheet is a framing plan, which shows a plan view of a superstructure and where the cross frames are located along the length of the girder. And we're going to zoom in a little bit here and show you some other elements. So again, you can see the span length. You can see the center line of bearing. For This is the center line of the bearing where the abutment would be. Over here, you can see the girder spacing. So this is, has four spaces at 10 foot 9 inches. And here are your girders. Here are your cross frames. So it also shows you your cross frame locations. And then also your field splice locations. And field splices are typically located where you might be going from different sizes of flanges or different sizes of webs when you're connecting two of um, the beam site or the uh, girder segments together. And those may vary depending on what types of loads you have in a certain area, what, type, what length your span is. You, know, you, can, you can vary the size of your flanges and your plates so that you can get a more efficient um, section. Next we have the girder elevation. So this shows the elevation view of the girder and any changes in section and where they occur. It also shows quite a few other elements. So we'll zoom in a little bit here again. So here's where you can see the flange sizes. So here's the bottom plate. The bottom flange is one and a quarter inch by 20. And then at this field, light field splice location, it changes to a one and three quarter inch by 24 inch bottom flange. Similarly, the web plate changes, or I'm sorry, the web plate is the same, 3 sixteenths of an inch by 62, and then you can see over here that it stays the same as 3 sixteenths by 62. But again, the top flange has changed. On this side of the splice, it's a 1 and 3 quarter inch by 20 inches, and on this side, 1 and a quarter inch by 16 inches. So you can find those plate changes and locations on the uh, girder elevation. Also on the girder elevation, you can see the, the shear stud spacing. And the shear studs are, are used to make the deck and the beam composite. You can also see the location of the center line of bearing on a girder elevation as well. This is a cross frame detail sheet. It shows the specifics of the cross frames, like the dimensions, the sizes of the angles and plates, and whether they're bolted or welded. And then last, I wanted to talk about a bearing detail sheet. This is, shows the bearing assembly dimensions, the material type, movement information, weld, and bolt details. This particular sheet shows a pot bearing detail. But as I mentioned earlier, pot bearings and disc bearings are interchangeable. So in this case, you can see how we've included a plan note that says the contractor may change to a disc bearing if, if they prefer to use that over the, the pot bearing. For all of our different uh, bearings, we also include the loads and the movements that are used in our design. And this enables um, the fabricator and the contractor to just understand what we use when, the, when we develop the dimensions and the design for the bearings. So it's important to have those on all of our bearing plan sheets.
All right, and here's another chance for you guys to show what you've learned. The question is, which of the following elements is not typically found on a framing plan? A, span lengths. B, field splice locations. C, cross frame locations. Or D, deck reinforcement. Just give everyone a few more seconds to answer their response. All right, Joanne, it looks like most people have chosen D, deck reinforcement. And that is correct because the deck reinforcement is actually usually shown on the typical section. And that concludes my portion. I'm now going to turn it over to Dominic who will actually get into more specifics about um, some of the design of steel structures. All right, thank you, Joanne. Our next speaker is Dominic Coletti. He is a senior bridge engineer with HDR in Raleigh, North Carolina. He received his bachelor's from Carnegie Mellon University and his master's from the University of Texas at Arlington. He has over 28 years of structural engineering experience. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you, Christina. All right, we're going to talk next in a little bit more detail about high girder bridge framing plans. And we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about framing plans tonight, and there's a reason for that. Framing plans are the heart of the steel superstructure drawings because they show the arrangement of all the main components of the structural steel superstructure, including the girders, the cross frames, the supports, the field splices, the stiffeners, and a number of other features. The interaction of all these components defines the behavior of the superstructure. While the framing plan drawing itself may look like a fairly simple plan sheet, the engineering design behind what appears on the framing plans is one of the most critical aspects of the design of a steel girder bridge. An effective framing plan with well-defined and efficient load paths will lead to an efficient design, but a poorly laid out framing plan will lead to all sorts of problems with, with the design. Now every bridge is unique and there's more than one right answer to how to arrange the framing for a given bridge. We don't really have enough time tonight to explain all the different nuances of how to develop a good framing plan for a steel girder bridge. We could literally talk for hours about that and have only scratched the surface. Instead, tonight we're going to walk through a series of example framing plans, each one illustrating a common geometric configuration for a steel girder bridge. We'll point out the various elements of those framing plans. We'll discuss some of the terminology used to describe them. And we'll discuss some of the issues that may be associated with them. We're going to begin with a fairly simple bridge. This is a straight bridge with straight girders. Now here are some of the main features of this particular framing plan. You can see here the framing plan shows the girders spanning longitudinally between the supports. It shows the cross frames that connect adjacent girders to each other. It's also showing the locations of the field splices. It's a line of field splices here and another line of field splices over here. And as Joanne mentioned earlier, those field splices are connecting different sections of the girders. The girders are broken up into pieces often for shipping because you can only ship so long of a piece on the U.S. highway system. So the girders will be broken into shorter pieces, shipped to the site, erected, and then connected in the air. The framing plan will also show stiffeners, such as the bearing stiffeners here at the supports. It may also show intermediate stiffeners out here in the span along the length of the girder. The bearing stiffeners help to stiffen the girder locally in order to carry the reactions in the span down into the substructure. The intermediate stiffeners serve to stiffen the web to increase the shear capacity of the girders. Now, in addition, framing plans also show a lot of dimensions. For example, the framing plans will show the spacing between the girders. They'll show typically the span length. They may show the distances between the field splice locations. They may show the spacing of the cross frames along the length of the girders. And if you have stiffeners out along the girders in between the cross frames, the framing plan may show 
the location of those stiffeners. The framing plan is also going to call out the girders, perhaps by number or letter, whichever the convention may be for the given uh, space that you're working in. Now with straight girders and only a slight skew, this would be a fairly simple bridge to analyze, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Right now we're going to show you a picture of a fairly simple straight girder bridge and highlight some of those features again. Again, here we have the girders spanning longitudinally between the supports. We have the cross frames connecting adjacent girders to each other. If you look carefully, you can see some darker areas, some darker bands along each of those girders. Those are where the bolted field splices are located. And that darker color is showing you a cluster of bolts. In this case, the bolts connecting the web of this section of the girder the web of this section of the girder. Now again, this is a fairly simple bridge. Someday I'd like to meet the roadway designer who laid out this interchange. I want to shake his hand, introduce him to the guys in my office so that he can teach them how to lay out simpler bridges. I never get to design bridges like this anymore. Now that was a straight bridge of straight girders. Next, we're going to talk about a curved girder bridge and show you a curved girder bridge framing plan. Again, we're going to highlight some of the main features. The framing plan shows the girders spanning between the supports longitudinally. In this case, the girders happen to be curved. The framing plan also shows the cross frames again, connecting adjacent girders to each other. Again, it's going to show you the field splice locations, intermediate stiffeners. It's going to show you all the same features that we saw on that straight girder bridge, only this is for a curved girder bridge. Still showing the same information, just a little bit different geometry. Now curved girder bridges are inherently more complicated than straight girder bridges. The curvature of the girders causes torsion in the girders locally, and the curvature of the entire superstructure causes overturning of the superstructure and significant interaction between the girders and the cross frames. In a curved girder bridge, the cross frames do more than just brace the girder flanges. They also carry primary loads between adjacent girders as load is shifted from the girders on the inside of the curve to the girders on the outside of the curve in response to that global overturning loading on the superstructure. Again, we want to show you this in real life. So we have a photo here of a curved girder bridge. You can see the girders, again, spanning between the supports. In this case, they just happen to be curved. You can see the cross frames connecting adjacent girders to each other. And again, you can see a bolted field splice right here. There's a pattern of bolts connecting the two webs, the web of this section of the girder and this section of the girder. You can see down here a pattern of bolts that are connecting the flanges of the girders together. In this case, this bridge is under construction. The deck is not yet in place. You happen to be able to see along the outside girder here, most of the overhang uh, false work and formwork for the deck overhang. Eventually, there'll be deck formwork in between the girders as well, similar to what Anna mentioned on one of her slides earlier tonight. Now, one specific feature of a framing plan is the definition of the orientation of the supports. The supports can be either radial or normal to the superstructure, or they can be skewed to the superstructure. In this example, we're looking at a bridge with radial or normal supports. Those terms radial and normal are used more or less interchangeably, and they indicate that the support is oriented at an angle of 90 degrees to the superstructure. If the superstructure is curved, that 90 degree angle is measured to the local tangent of the curvature at the point of the support. You can see that here. This is the orientation of the support. This happens to be at the end of this particular unit. There's another support over here. This is a framing plan of a multi-span continuous girder bridge. But you can see that that support is oriented at an angle of 90 degrees to the local tangent at the point of support. That indicates that the support is radial or normal to the bridge. Now 
We have a few examples here, and I want to highlight that it doesn't matter whether the girders are curved or straight. The definition of the support orientation is independent of the curvature of the girders or the fact that the girders may be straight. The key factor is the angle between the support and the girders. If the girders are straight, that 90 degree angle is measured against the straight line that represents the alignment of the girders. If the girders happen to be curved, that 90 degree angle is measured to the local tangent at the point of support. So these cross frames and this support here are radial or normal for this bridge. This support here is also normal for this straight girder bridge. Now, if the supports are not radial or normal to the superstructure, then you have what are called skewed supports. This framing plan is an example of a bridge with skewed supports. Now, the key here is that the support is oriented at an angle other than 90 degrees to the superstructure. You can see that very clearly illustrated here. There's a support that is oriented along this red line here. The local tangent to the girder at the point of support is this direction, and the angle between the two of them is less than 90 degrees. This represents a skewed support condition. Now this support and this angle, I should say, this angle could be less than 90 degrees or it could be greater than 90 degrees. Either way, as long as it's not 90 degrees, it's a skewed support. Now the measurement of the skew varies from state to state. Different states have different conventions for measuring this uh, this angle. Some states will measure the angle between the local tangent and the support. In this case, they would call this a 30 degree skew. Other states may measure the angle between the support and a normal line to the superstructure, in which case this support would be considered a 60 degree skew. Same exact bridge, same exact geometry, just different terminology, different ways of defining that angle. Now, Note that this bridge is also curved with curved girders. Whether a bridge is considered to have skewed supports or not is independent of whether the superstructure or the girders are curved or straight. The key is just the angle between the support and the local tangent of the superstructure's alignment. We have a few examples here of skewed supports. This photo here and this photo here of the same bridge, this is taken from below and this is taken from above. You can see this, the skew of the support very clearly here in this photo locally. You can see it here, a little bit bigger picture view. And this happens to be a straight bridge with straight girders and skewed supports. Here we have a picture of a pair of girders that are being erected for a curved girder bridge that also has skewed supports. And you can see that here at the end. As you look at all the cross frames, you'll notice that these cross frames are radial to the girders, except for this last cross frame, this last diaphragm here, which is the end diaphragm, and it's fairly significantly skewed. And when it rests on the support over here, that support is similarly skewed. Again, it doesn't matter whether the girders are straight or curved. It's just the angle between the support and the alignment of the superstructure. Okay. We're gradually building our framing plan vocabulary. We've defined many of the components which are typically shown on a framing plan, and we've talked about several geometric characterizations of framing plans, such as straight versus curved and radial versus skewed supports. Up until now, we've only looked at bridges of constant width. In a few minutes, we're going to see some bridges which have variable width. But before we do, let's talk about how that constant width affects the framing plan. Now, as you might expect, if the width of a bridge is constant, the girders are typically oriented parallel to each other. And here's what I mean. You can see that here as we've highlighted each of the girders here, again, spanning longitudinally between the supports. But since this bridge is of constant width, the spacing between the girders is the same along the entire length of the girders. This girder is parallel to this girder, parallel to this girder, and so on. We have a few photos showing some examples of bridges with constant width and parallel girders. 
Again, it's fairly easy to see. This is a fairly simple geometric arrangement. The girders are parallel to each other along the length of the span. Now, if the width of the bridge is not constant, but if instead that width varies, things get a little bit more interesting. When you have a variable width bridge, the girder spacing will probably need to be variable as well at some point or another. Now, there are many different ways to accomplish this. We're not going to show all of the possibilities tonight, but right here we're just showing one common case. In this particular case, none of the girders in this bridge are parallel to each other. Instead, their spacing varies linearly. You can see that here. We've highlighted several of the girders. So the girder on the left exterior edge of the bridge, girder number one. And you can see when you look at girder number four, it's definitely not parallel to girder number one. Girder number six isn't either. Girder number nine isn't either. And if you look closely at this framing plan, each of those girders is uh, varies, the spacing between the girders varies in a linear fashion. Now, this approach has pros and cons. The geometry here is all regular. That is, the variations are more or less linear as you go along the length of the bridge. Now, this type of, of an arrangement will help keep load distribution among the girders more uniform. The downside in this case is that every cross frame in this bridge is a different length, which will make fabrication of the cross frames more complicated. And we wanted to show an alternate here just to see what some other possibilities were. Another way to lay out the framing plan for this, group, for this particular bridge would be to have several girders parallel, then have a variable width spacing, and then have more girders parallel. You can see if we take this green framing plan and overlay it on the bridge, it covers exactly the same area, and that the orientation of girder one along the left edge of the bridge is the same as the goal, as, is the same in either case, whether you have the red framing plan or the green one. Similarly, the orientation of girder nine on the right edge of the bridge is the same whether you have the red framing plan or the green framing plan. It's the girders in between that are different. Now, this particular orientation has some advantages and disadvantages. It has the advantage of having many of the cross frames being the same width, which will simplify fabrication. But it has the disadvantage that you're going to have a very significant variation in the spacing between these two girders here. That will affect the load distribution a little bit more. It may make it a little bit more challenging to size the girders in this particular arrangement. Neither way is right or wrong. They're just different. Both ways have pros and cons. I wanted to show you uh, an example of a real bridge with variable girder spacing. And in this case, we got one that was fairly interesting looking. This is a pedestrian bridge in Austin, Texas. Um, the basic alignment of the bridge was laid out by an architect who happened to be uh, thinking of a concept where two large curves overlapped. It had a curve this way and then a curve this way. And in this case, this arrangement worked well for this particular bridge because there was a destination over here, a destination over here. We had two ramps that came into the main unit of the bridge. And on the other bank, there was a destination over here and another destination over here. So it made sense to have all of those four corners connected in a certain way. This way happened to have some architectural flow to it. But it led to a fairly interesting framing plan where the girders are definitely not parallel. This girder flares out and back in again and out again. And you can see the same over here. The girder flares in, flares back out, flares in, flares out again. And the spacing between those two exterior girders and the single straight interior girder varies along the entire length of the bridge. Okay, so far we've kept things fairly simple. Even the curved bridges, even the skewed bridges, even that variable width bridge that we just saw have been fairly tame in terms of their geometry. This time we're going to go a little bit more wild and mix all of those different pieces together. This bridge is curved in two directions. It curves off to the left this way, and it also curves off to the right this way. It has some skewed supports, 
this one for example, and this one for example. It also has some radial supports. There's a radial support right here and another one right here. There are some parts of this bridge which are constant width and some parts which are variable width. In fact, as this bridge gets wider, some of the parts get narrower, and to top it all off, the bridge splits in two right here. It's a fairly interesting bridge. You might be thinking nobody would ever really design a bridge like this in the real world, but they did, and I have photographic proof of it right here. Thought it would be nice to show you some photographs of this particular bridge. You can see where that ramp structure is branching off here and here. The main bridge is continuing on over here. A few photos looking from a different direction. Again, there's the main bridge continuing on. It's eventually going to curve off to the left here. And here's the ramp bridge that's curving off to the right and the location where the two bridges split apart. What I really want to focus here on this particular framing plan is just one part of it, a place where the girders bifurcate. Now, if you're familiar with column design, you may recall that the term bifurcation is sometimes associated with column buckling. The bifurcation load is the load at which the bowing of the column starts to self-amplify. If you're below the bifurcation load, then the second order effects converge to a stable condition. But if you're above the bifurcation load, the second order effects diverge. The bowing of the column keeps going on and on, getting more and more severe, and eventually the column buckles. The definition here is similar in that when the girders bifurcate in a framing plan, they separate and diverge. In fact, the dictionary definition of bifurcation is the division of something into two branches or parts. That's what we're going to show you here tonight, and we're going to zoom in on this area here to show you some of the specific features. Now, when you look at this a little bit more closely, you can see that things are getting pretty complicated. There's a lot of different pieces and parts to this, all going in different directions. But it's still a framing plan. It's still showing the girders spanning longitudinally between the supports. It's still showing the cross frames connecting adjacent girders to each other. But you can see here that there's a very interesting girder that stops or begins right here. It doesn't continue back to the support over here on the left side of the picture but it does continue on from this point off to the right. At this location here, that girder is supported by a cross beam, sometimes called a transfer beam, a bulkhead, a cross girder. There's a number of terms that would be used to describe this structure here. They all serve the same function. They span between this girder and this girder over here to support the end of this new girder that's being introduced into the framing plan. We can show you a picture of that here. This is the location where that new girder picks up. And if you look here, we've zoomed in on it a little bit. You can see that girder coming back from the support and stopping right at this location. You can see that bulkhead or cross frame, cross diaphragm, whichever term you may choose to use on it, the solid plate diaphragm here that's accepting the end of that girder and transferring its load transversely to either of the girders on either side. Okay, we've talked a lot about girders so far. We've talked about straight girders, we've talked about curved girders, we've even talked about bifurcating girders. And girders are a very important part in the steel girder bridge. But there's another very important part of the structural steel framing plan, another very important part of the structural steel bridge, and that's the cross frame. One of the most important features of a framing plan is the arrangement and orientation of the cross frames. Now, there are two main categories that we want to illustrate tonight that describe the orientation of the cross frames. The first one has kind of a funny name. It's up on the slide right now, and it's called contiguous. Contiguous cross frames are cross frames that all line up. Contiguous is the actual word in the AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications. Now, contiguous cross frames may be skewed to the girders, or they may be radial or normal to the girders. 
And you can see a couple of different cases illustrated here. You can see that these are contiguous cross frames. They're all lined up with each other end to end across the width of the bridge. And in this case, these cross frames are skewed to the girder. The angle between the cross frame and the girder is something other than 90 degrees. Now in this case down below, we can see that the cross frames again are contiguous. They're all lined up end to end across the width of the bridge. But in this case, those cross frames are oriented normal or radial to the girders. In either case, these are contiguous cross frames. In one case, they're slightly skewed to the girders. In the other case, they're radial. We have a couple of photos here, and these should be familiar to you, the pictures that we showed earlier tonight. And these are showing examples of contiguous cross frames. In this particular curved girder bridge, you can see that all the cross frames are aligned end to end across the width of the bridge. You can see the same thing in this straight bridge. Again, all the cross frames are lined up in a straight line across the width of the bridge. You can see it here as well in this curved girder bridge. Now the other common cross frame pattern is a pattern with staggered cross frames. Staggered cross frames don't line up. Instead, they're typically oriented normal to the girders, but their position along the length of the girders are staggered from bay to bay. And you can see that here. Each of these cross frames are oriented normal to the girders that they're framing between, but their position is staggered. There's one cross frame here. You go down the length of the girder a little bit. There's another cross frame here. Go down the length of the girder, and there's another cross frame here. And they kind of stair step across the length and width of the framing plan. Now, there are various advantages and disadvantages to using contiguous or staggered cross frames. Discussing all of the nuances of when to use one versus the other is a little bit beyond the scope of what we want to cover tonight. But it is a very important part of the framing plan because it directly affects the behavior of the superstructure. It directly affects the loads, the load distribution to adjacent girders. It also affects how the loads are applied to each of the girders and how the girders respond to them. The pattern also is going to affect the loads in the cross frames themselves. And we have a couple of uh, examples here of a bridge with staggered cross frames. Again, you've seen this bridge earlier tonight. We used it to illustrate the concept of the skewed support. And you can see in this case, with that skewed support, the cross frames, or in this case diaphragms, are staggered as you go along the length of the bridge. Okay, there's one last framing plan feature that I wanted to discuss tonight and that's lateral bracing. Joanne mentioned this earlier on one of her slides. We wanted to discuss it in a little bit more detail here. Lateral bracing is bracing that spans from one girder to the next in a horizontal plane. Lateral bracing is typically provided in a truss configuration. That is to say that the lateral brace members are oriented diagonally. And you can see that here in this framing plan. Again, as always, there's a girder spanning longitudinally between the supports. There are cross frames connecting adjacent girders to each other. And then in the exterior bay of this particular bridge, there's lateral bracing that's oriented in a truss type configuration. The members are oriented diagonally in a horizontal plane spanning between the two adjacent girders. And this particular bridge has lateral bracing in this exterior bay and also in this exterior bay. Now lateral bracing is most commonly used on relatively long span steel plate girder bridges. On those longer spans, there's more potential for global lateral buckling of the entire superstructure and more potential for very large lateral displacements prior to the deck being constructed and made composite with the steel girder superstructure. Providing lateral bracing increases the lateral stiffness of the superstructure system prior to the deck placement and improves global lateral torsional buckling resistance. And we have a couple of photos here illustrating lateral bracing on a bridge. This happens to be the bridge that was in the framing plan we just saw on the previous slide. 
So you can see in this exterior bay, there's lateral bracing between the exterior girder and the first interior girder. Also in this exterior bay, there's lateral bracing. And in the smaller photo here, you can see a close-up of it. That lateral bracing spanning diagonally from girder to girder in a horizontal plane. And here's our last question for the evening. What are the two main orientations of supports for steel girder bridges? A, normal and radial. B, normal and radical. C, radial and skewed. Or D, skewed and staggered. All right, Dominic, it looks like most people have selected C, radial and skewed. Good, and that is the correct answer. Now, we tried to get a little bit tricky with this quiz, and we mixed some of the terms together just to see if everybody was paying attention. The first answer, A, it says normal and radial. Those are both words that are used to describe the orientation of the supports of the bridge, but normal and radial, if you remember from earlier on, describe the same condition, a condition where that support is oriented 90 degrees to the superstructure. Radial and skewed describe the two different main orientations of supports to the superstructure. Um, radial could be either radial or normal, and skewed is the second characterization. I'm a little bit disappointed nobody chose normal and radical. I know we're all engineers, but it's okay to loosen up a little bit once in a while. Okay, we've talked a lot about framing plans. We're going to take a few minutes now before the end of the presentation tonight to talk about analysis methods for steel girder superstructures. We're going to keep this discussion fairly high level and just talk about broad categories of analysis methods. Most analysis methods for steel girder superstructures fall into one of two broad categories, line girder analysis methods or refined analysis methods. Now most of the refined analysis methods fall into two subcategories of either 2D or 3D methods, so line girder methods are sometimes called 1D methods. We're going to talk about line girder analysis methods first. Now the fundamental feature of a line girder analysis is that it considers only one girder isolated from the rest of the structural steel framing system. There's no consideration of system behavior, no consideration of the interaction between the girders and the cross frames or the girders and the deck, at least not directly in the analysis. The effects of the deck or the cross frames are addressed only in very simplified ways. The analysis of the moments and the shears and the girders is done by simple beam analysis of that single girder. As a result, line girder analysis as a final design analysis method is really only appropriate for fairly simple bridges, typically bridges with straight girders and little or no skew. Line girder analysis can be used for preliminary design and validation of more complex bridge analysis models, as long as you recognize the limitations of the line girder analysis methods. Now, for more complicated bridges, maybe a curved or severely skewed bridge, you can use what are called the refined analysis methods. There are several subcategories of refined analysis methods, including two-dimensional grid analysis, two-dimensional plate and eccentric beam analysis, and three-dimensional finite element analysis. In a 2D grid analysis, the superstructure is modeled using a two-dimensional array of nodes and line elements. The girders are typically modeled using line elements. The diaphragms are similarly modeled using line elements. And the deck is effectively modeled in strips using line elements or modifications to the section properties of the line elements that were used to model the girders and the diaphragms. Now, there's some, there are some important simplifying assumptions associated with 2D grid modeling. Key among these is that the live load distribution in the bridge analysis model is accomplished using empirical live load distribution factors 
similar to those used in a line girder analysis. Now a variant of a 2D grid analysis is what's called a 2D plate and eccentric beam model. In a plate and eccentric beam model, the girders and the cross frames are still modeled using line elements, that two-dimensional array of nodes and line elements, but the deck is modeled using plate or shell type elements offset from the grid of girders and cross frame elements. As a result, in a plate and eccentric beam analysis, the live load is distributed through the structure based on a relative stiffness analysis, which is a much more refined approach than what you would get from a 2D grid model. Now the most refined analysis method typically used in production bridge design is a 3D finite element analysis model. In a 3D model, all the various pieces and parts of the superstructure are explicitly modeled. The flanges of the girders are typically modeled using beam or plate type elements. The webs of the girders are separately modeled using plate or shell type elements. The diaphragms and any bracing members are separately modeled using truss or plate type elements as appropriate for the type of structure. And the deck is modeled separately using solid or plate type elements. Now this gives a very refined model of the stiffness of the structure. This also allows the user to obtain direct analysis results for each and every part of the superstructure. For example, if you want to know the force in a cross frame top cord member at a particular location in the bridge, you can get direct analysis results for that member directly from the model. Now the downside of a 3D finite element analysis is obviously that it's a very complicated analysis method. It's going to take more time and effort, and the resulting model is going to be a little bit more susceptible to hidden errors that may be difficult to detect. So which analysis method should you use? The answer, unfortunately, is it depends. It depends on the complexity of the bridge, the time and the money that you have available to perform the analysis, and your own comfort level with various analysis methods. The key is that the analysis method you use should be appropriate for the complexity of the bridge, particularly the geometric complexity of the bridge. And we don't have sufficient time tonight to go into a further discussion of how to choose the right analysis method, but I can point you to three excellent references. The first one here on the left is NCHRP Report 725, Guidelines for Analysis Methods and Construction Engineering of Curved and Skewed Steel Girder Bridges. This is a fairly extensive research project in which the researchers analyzed over 70 different steel girder bridges using different analysis methods. They would analyze each bridge using simplified 1D analysis methods. 2D analysis methods, and they would compare the results of those to a benchmark 3D finite element analysis of each bridge. By comparing all those results, they were able to assess the accuracy of each of the analysis methods and provide recommendations based on the geometric complexity of the bridge as to which analysis methods were more or less appropriate. The second reference here is an AASHTO NSBA steel bridge collaboration document. This is guideline G13.1, Guidelines for Steel Girder Bridge Analysis. Now this is a largely qualitative set of guidelines. It was written by a committee of practicing bridge engineers, academic researchers, uh, state DOT representatives, fabricators and erectors, and it represents some consensus guidelines for approaching the analysis of steel girder bridges. This particular guideline also happens to include a summary of the NCHRP report 725 results. It's presented in one of the appendices in the form of a simple scorecard. Finally, this reference on the right is the FHWA's recently released Manual for Refined Analysis. Don't be fooled by the watermark that says draft on this particular manual. Uh, if you go and pull this manual down from the FHWA website now, it does call it a draft, but that's only because they plan to have a second volume that goes into more detail on particular types of bridge modeling, and they know when they complete that second volume, there'll be a few things they want to update in the first volume. Now, this manual is a very comprehensive guideline for how to specifically build refined analysis models. It goes into great detail discussing the various elements used to build those models, 
and how to use them properly. Each one of these references is available free for download on the Internet, and they're all fairly easy to find. Now, what we talked about so far was the analysis part of analysis and design. That is, the calculation of the distribution, distribution of loads throughout the structure and the prediction of the behavior of the structure. But you also need criteria to compare that behavior to. The design part of analysis and design is covered by the, the design specifications. For most steel girder highway bridges, the design specification is the AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications. Now, as Anna mentioned at the beginning of this presentation tonight, there's going to be a full discussion of the AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications in session two of the AISC night school on bridge design. So we're not going to go into great detail on the AASHTO specifications tonight. Now, if on the other hand, you're designing a steel girder railroad bridge, you will probably be using the ARIMA manual for railway engineering, specifically chapter 15, steel structures. In some ways, designing a railroad bridge is very similar to designing a highway bridge, but in other ways, it's very different. For instance, the AASHTO bridge design specifications for highway bridges follow a load and resistance factor, LRFD, design approach. But the ARIMA bridge design specifications for railroad bridge design follow the older allowable stress design, or ASD, approach. Railroad bridges are also designed for a different and much heavier live load, the Cooper E80 railroad loading. In addition, the choice of structure type, the basic structure configuration, and many of the design details for railroad bridges are very different from their highway bridge counterparts. These differences typically arise from the unique needs of railroad bridge owners. For instance, railroad bridges are typically designed as simple span structures. Railroads are critical lifelines for their owners, and convenient detour routes are often not available, and simple span structures lend themselves to much faster replacement in the event of damage to a bridge. Simple span structures also often feature simpler, more robust details that perform better under the heavier train loading common for railroad bridges. Okay, we're about to wrap things up for the evening. We wanted to have a quick recap of what we covered tonight. Tonight was session one, Introduction to Bridge Engineering. In this session tonight, we discussed bridge nomenclature, gave you some examples of the various terms that are used to describe the different pieces and parts of a bridge. We reviewed different types of bridges. We also described a lot of the components that compose a girder bridge superstructure. We also discussed briefly some of the components that compose the substructures and foundations of bridges. We walked through a typical bridge plan set to show you how it's organized and the content of the various plan sheets that appear in that set. And then we spent a fair amount of time discussing high girder bridge framing plans in particular. We went through a quick discussion of analysis methods, and then we wrapped things up with a very short review of the design codes that are typically used to design steel girder bridges. And with that, we have time for a few questions, I believe, and I'll turn things back over to Christine. Let us Thank know you, how Dominic. we're doing on time. Yes, um, we have a few minutes left for questions, um, and we have quite a few tonight, so we'll try our best to answer as many as we can. And the first question that we have tonight, um, we'll start with Anna. I'm taking us to slide 22. Uh, is there any difference between an end bent and an abutment? No, there's really no difference. It's just dependent on the agency or the state. Um, it's just their preference. So it's interchangeable in as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thank you. And can the terms pier and bent be used interchangeably as well, or is one specific for a bridge over waterways? Uh, no, one is not specific for bridge over waterways. Um, they are also interchangeable, and again, just depends on the agency or the state. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the next question, I'll take us to slide 36. For cable stayed and suspension bridges, are the cables considered a part of the substructure or superstructure? 
the cables themselves are considered part of the superstructure. And I know this picture is a little deceiving because actually part of our substructure is above the deck, which is the superstructure. And so I know that's a little confusing. Like I had mentioned before, there's exceptions to every rule. Um, our substructure unit here, all you know, this support system that comes all the way up here is actually part of the substructure. However, the cables themselves are part of the superstructure. Okay, thank you, Anna. And I have a few questions for Joanne. I'm going to take us to slide 60 where you're discussing bearings. The question is, are guided bearings unidirectional only? Um, yes, they're unidirectional. This picture shows um, it being guided in the longitudinal mm -hmm. direction, but it could also be guided in the transverse direction as well. But it is unidirectional. Okay, thank you. Um, next I'm going to take us to slide 68 where you discuss these integral piers. The question is, how is an integral pier constructed? Well, I, I would, I guess I would explain it as the pier cap is formed just like we, when we showed deck forms before, they build forms around the concrete portion of the, the, um, the pier cap itself. So the beams would be temporarily supported, the forms would be built up for the concrete part of the, the pier cap, and then the concrete would be poured inside of that form around the steel beams. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I have a few questions for Dominic. I'm going to take us to slide 85. We had a few questions um, regarding splices. Um, using this picture as an example, or maybe the uh, previous slide, uh, which is a, a framing plan, could you tell us what would be uh, the ideal splice location for a bridge like this, and are, what factors would you consider, and are there any rules of thumb? That's a very good question. Um, and I'll discuss the general case first, and then I'll discuss this particular bridge in this photo second. In the general case, splices, bolted field splices are most commonly used on multiple span continuous bridges, bridges that are spanning more than one span continuously over a number of supports. And in those cases, the ideal location for a bolted field splice is at the point of dead load contraflexure. That's where the moments and the girders will be the lowest, which will place the least amount of demand on the splice. That splice is an interruption in the continuity of the structural steel along the length of the bridge. There's a lot of holes, a lot of bolts, there's a lot of little pieces and parts in there. And it's best to make those kind of connections at the location of the lowest loads. That's the general rule of thumb. Now, in this particular case, we have a single span bridge, and they're providing splices here primarily because of the shipping length. This particular bridge has a fairly long span length. Uh, if I remember correctly, and don't quote me on this, I believe this bridge spans about 200 feet. Typically, the shipping length for a steel girder is limited in most states somewhere as low as 130 feet, sometimes up to 150 feet, sometimes longer. It depends on the route that you're taking to the project site from the fabrication shop. But in this case, since the girders are so long, it wasn't practical to transport them to the site in one piece. So even though this is a simple span structure, all in positive moment, and these splice locations are not necessarily at a point of dead load contraflexure, because there aren't any in a simple span bridge. Um, these splice locations were instead chosen to be as close to the supports as possible, as close to the lowest moment region of the girder as they could be, without making the distance between the splices too long, and thus making the shipping length too long. And that would be this length from here to here. Okay, thank you. And then um, related question, is there a, um, a rule of thumb or what factors would you consider for the ratio of the cross frame spacing to the girder spacing? 
Another very good question. You guys want to get down into all the details. I'm sorry we didn't have time to go into all of this tonight. Uh, the, the, in a straight girder bridge where the demand on the cross trains is fairly low, a bridge like this, straight girders and little or no skew, the cross trains in this bridge are going to have fairly low demand. Uh, a typical cross frame spacing might be in the order of 25 feet. And that cross frame spacing is chosen to balance out the number of cross frames versus the size of the girders. Cross frames are fairly expensive to fabricate, so you want to try to reduce their size and the number of them. But if you space the cross frames too far apart, then they're not going to serve to effectively brace the flanges of the girders to resist bending moments. The tighter the cross frame spacing is, the more efficient the girder can be designed, but the more cross frames you'll have. So it's a balance between the two of them. Now, in another type of structure, a structure with a severe skew or a curved girder structure, um, the demand, the loads on the cross frames are going to be higher because they're doing a lot more work connecting the girders together and distributing load. And the demand on the girders will be higher. And in those types of structures, sometimes you'll see a tighter cross frame spacing. Often you'll see heavier cross frames. OK, thank you. Um, and then related to that, uh, what's the difference between lateral bracing and cross frames? Um, cross frames are provided in almost every steel girder bridge. They have the primary function of bracing the compression flange of the girder. They have the secondary function of helping to distribute loads between the girders, particularly in skewed and curved bridges. But cross frames in and of themselves don't do a lot to provide lateral stiffness to the superstructure overall. Lateral bracing, which is bracing provided in a horizontal plane between the girders, provides a lot more lateral stiffness. That lateral stiffness helps to resist lateral deflections during construction before the deck is in place, perhaps a wind loading. It also provides a lot more stability to resist global buckling of the system. Once the deck is in place and it's hardened and been made composite with the girders, that deck functions very effectively as a shear diaphragm in a horizontal plane. And all of those concerns about lateral deflections and lateral stability go away because you have a great big concrete diaphragm on top of the structure. During construction, when that concrete deck is not in place, Depending upon the nature of the structure, the span length, the size of the members, and so on, you may need additional lateral stability, lateral stiffness, and that's provided by that top flange lateral bracing, bracing in a horizontal plane. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. If you asked a question and it was not answered, we will get back to you by email. Now, for those of you who registered for the eight session package, you'll receive your PDH certificate at the end of all eight sessions. Now let's discuss the recording and quiz access. An email with a link to the quiz will be sent out to you by Wednesday. If you watched the live version tonight, you'll receive your PDH credit. You do not have to take the quiz to receive credit if you watch live. But you can still take the quiz to reinforce what you learned here tonight. If you watch the recorded version instead of the live one, and you would like PDH credit, you must take and pass the quiz to receive credit. If you're interested in getting the EEU certificate at the end of the course, you must take all of the quizzes and the final exam. If you'd like to listen to the recording, you'll receive information on how to access it, you know, in case you missed part of it or want to watch it again. And this will be emailed to you by Wednesday.